The following is a Spirit Street production. This is a really busy time of the year, people. Transfer portals going on. It's springtime. Both basketball and football are trying to figure out their rosters for not only this year, but next year. A lot to, to, to cover. We're going to get into it today with Iowa State and Kansas. This is the Big 12 Insiders. Welcome to the Big 12 Insiders, your Big 12 sports show, presented by Synergy Financial Partners. Now let's go to booming North Texas, home of Studio 73. Here's your host, Brian Hanley. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Big 12 Insiders. Today, we've got Michael Swain, who covers Kansas for 24-7 sports, and Alec Busey, who covers Iowa State for 24-7 sports. Fellas, how are you guys doing today? I feel like I'm, like, like drowning. First, <laughs> I'm yeah. drowning slowly. I don't know about you, Alec. Like, there's a lot going on. And it's hard. Yeah, to I mean, I'm literally in the process of writing a uh, news brief about a kid entering the portal. So that takes people into the life of what it's like to be uh, a sports reporter in college sports right now. Man, I mean, just a ton going on right now. We thought December is busy. And don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. December is busy. But this is where you got like the double whammy. It's like basketball just ended. The portal just opened. Football portal opened. And, you know, it, spring practice is going on for football for a lot of places. Look, I, I kind of think, and I'll ask your all's opinion on this. It's I mean, just like you said, Alex, somebody going into the portal right now. I think a lot of these programs kind of foresaw, okay, you know what? Maybe we won't get as many people jumping into the portal if we move back spring practice to where it, it the portal opens up right in the middle of spring practice. Maybe they'll wait. I've seen a, across the country, there are a ton of kids that are just not, that no, doesn't matter. I know we're eight practices in, I'm getting in the portal. It's almost like they've seen the handwriting on the wall already and they're wanting to get into it. My thing is either you knew before pr spring practice started or can't you just wait until it's over with to go someplace else? I don't know. That's just my opinion. I'll start with you, Alex, since you had somebody jump in a few minutes ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think I would counter and just be like, well, if you're if you know you're going to leave at some point during the spring, what's the point in sticking it out through the rest of spring practice? Um, I think these kids know where they're at on the depth chart very often. They're not stupid. They can see where they're going through drills. Um, and in the case of a lot of kids who are older and maybe in their third or fourth year in college, if they're still at the bottom of the depth chart, there's no reason for them to stick around for that last spring practice or that last spring game. Uh, before entering the transfer portal, because what are you waiting on at that point? And at that point, I think you're only kind of hurting yourself in your own transfer recruitment. That said, I don't blame kids, I think, for trying to stick around for another semester. Maybe they're trying to get their degree at the end of the spring semester after the fall season. Um, so they could be a graduate transfer, especially if you're that close to getting a degree. Or maybe they just want to stick it out and see if they can work their way into the rotation or work their way higher up on the depth chart. So I certainly understand why kids enter when there's still time left in spring practice. And I think a lot of times that decision to enter um, while spring practices are still going on is pretty often like an educated decision on their part or that of their family or their camp. I, I agree with you. I think it's a two way street, right? I think on the one hand, all these schools do the exit interviews right at the end of the season. And I'm sure hard conversations are had then. And I think to some degree, probably, players are thinking, screw you, coach. You think I can't play here. Let me put in the work in the weight room and try and show you during spring practice. And then there's probably a realization that when spring practice does come around that, oh man, like this isn't really going to work out for me here. So I, I probably should go. Timing wise, look, I think to some degree colleges are going to change when they do spring practice. I think more, more schools yeah. are going to do what a program like KU did where they literally finished the day the portal opened. Tuesday was their final day of spring practice. And I think you're going to see a lot of schools do that just to make sure they have the numbers yep. because there's a world in which a, a program like Colorado can have a huge amount of exodus and they may not even have enough guys at a certain position to like do like a full blown spring game. Like Kansas had to cancel their spring game five, six years ago because they had so many offensive line injuries. Like right. I think it's kind of a two way street with these decisions where I don't think you can necessarily blame players trying to get a head start. The earlier you're in the portal, the earlier you can get offers and get on campus, and those spots go quickly. So I think it's kind of a one of those two-way streets where I get why players want to stick around, right, compete for your spot, but also why, hey, when this week does come, why you might be inclined to get in early rather than waiting a week, 10 days, when honestly some schools are probably going to start filling up on spots. 
right? I guess one question that I always ask, and I know this is asking a lot of the NCAA, uh, to do something that actually makes sense. That <laughs> makes make sense for the most part. Look, the spring practice is over in May. I mean, I, I don't know a whole lot of schools that are still going, and I always call it Derby Day because Derby Day is the first Saturday in May. That might be maybe the last day that – that schools could possibly be in a spring. Because if you're going past that, you're going too long, in my opinion. But having said that, do you think the NCAA moves the, the transfer date back to where, okay, these kids get this opportunity or maybe they want to get in early, but they just move the transfer portal back to where it's kind of what you said, Michael, when spring practice is officially over, that they move it back? Yeah, I think, well – you can just look at the guy generally like the dates that they choose to open the transfer portal is pretty bad. Mm -hmm. uh, think about December, how that impacts bowl season. You think about, you know, a program like Iowa state getting a commitment from a transfer during the NCAA turn when they are still competing. Like yes. there's just some certain things here that you wonder like, man, like could this have been done a little bit better where there's that dead period, right? Right after, right before the final four and a little bit after, or maybe, Hey, that's the time when you have the portal open. And then for football, I think you're right. Like, you know, May 1st, it opens and then it closes May 30th, um, you know, Memorial Day. Like, I think that could probably make some sense. But yeah, I think timing wise, like it's tough. Like, and I don't think it's probably in the best spot right now. But look, I think uh, everyone loves to complain about the transfer portal, me included. But I think <laughs> there are just some more tweaks that need to happen if this is going to continue. Right. I just think you'll consider to see schools try and manipulate it to be in their advantage in some sense. Like you said, schools are pushing spring practice back further now than it was a couple of years ago. And I think one of the reasons they're doing that is in hopes of keeping the players that they want on their roster on their roster for longer. Um, and I think that that's kind of like a constant battle that you're seeing across the entire college sports landscape right now is schools trying to fight in certain ways, like the freedom that athletes have right now, whether it's, you know, trying to get like as far as the employment status and trying to get Congress involved with NIL and transfers and that's like really big picture, right? Where the schools are trying to gain some control back or it's just something as little picture as when you're starting spring practices. Um, it, I was talking with friends about this last night um, as I got home from the gym. They were complaining about the transfer portal and and they kind of wish it would go back to the old way. And they were kind of joking because they're my age. So they kind of get the whole like players should be paid. Players should have freedom of movement. But there's just the natural like fan frustration that exists with you know, a three year or four year player that's been successful transferring and leaving that school for another one. Um, and I kind of just compared like the entire state of college sports right now, just to being unsettled to kind of like what the United States was under the articles of confederation where like, we didn't really know what we were doing after we broke away from England and after we won the revolutionary war, but we were like kind of trying to figure it out. Like, I kind of think that's what's happening right now in college sports and no one has any idea. Just like give it a few years and be patient. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff will kind of settle itself over time, but no one is patient. No one wants to wait for change that, right. to things that they don't I, like. I love the analogy. The only <laughs> thing you. that I would push back well, on is yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. My dad is a high school social studies teacher. No, I love it, man. I absolutely love it. The only difference was at least there was a governing body that somebody that was in charge. Where here, the, the people that are supposed to be in charge, the NCAA, they literally have no power. To do anything they can't enforce any rules anything otherwise the courts just smack them on the hand and say no you can't do that but I, I love that analogy because I think it's fitting and I think you're right I think it's a lot of it is fans are just frustrated with that fact always go back and I try to explain it to people and say look just treat it like a regular job I know we don't want to look at college as a job but if you do that that's what this is because College athletics for so long has been a business and nobody really wanted to look at it that way. It's always been biz, big business. I mean, that's there's no doubt about that. So if you go back and you look at it like a job, like, OK, what what do you do at a job? You get to a certain point. Somebody has a better offer for you. Either you can decide to stay or you decide to move on. I go and it's the same thing. I know college. Look, I, I, I get it. I Trust me. I 100 percent get it. But universities in, in, and even on both sides have been a business for a long time, Michael. I don't think that we should look at it any other way than it being a business. Now it just happens to be more in our face where the students have, or well, I say the students, the college athletes, whoever you want to say, they yeah. just have more of a say in, in, in what they have and more power, I should say. 
Yeah, it's a t- well, it's so interesting because I think it is turning into professional sports, right? And I do understand, right, what Alex said, the frustration. Like, I think there's a lot of discourse with Kansas fans going on around the basketball program where I think Kansas for a long time, you think about guys like Frank Mason, Perry Ellis, Devontae Graham, like guys that will have their jerseys retired, right? They were right. four-year players, guys that you saw as freshmen make terrible mistakes and Bill Self yanks them. But then by the time they're seniors, they're all conference players, players that can lead you to a second weekend of the NCAA tournament, a final four, um, be a national player of the year. And now in basketball, at least it, it, that part is kind of gone where yeah. if a freshman doesn't play, well, they're probably going to leave because they want to go play and they'll go transfer to, uh, you know, I don't know, mid-major and go try and play there. And I think there's just a it's a tug of war, right, where I think fans of college athletes or of college sports liked the idea that you got to see guys grow and it didn't feel kind of gross with some of the, the money and obviously right. the different numbers you see out there with stuff. But I just think it's a different spot now. And I, I really agree with Alex's point that I get that frustration where watching the guys grow – and if you're a different type of program like Kansas basketball or look like Kansas football was where KU had two guys get poached, you know, they had a, a right. defensive lineman go to Auburn and a defensive or an offensive lineman go to Texas A&M. And those are two guys that will probably be starting next, this next year. And KU did the brunt work. They came to Kansas, they developed. And then when they're ready to make, to make the jump up to the SEC and the big leagues, they did. And so right. I think that's probably where you're in the, it's just tough because you can't blame the kids because for a lot of these guys, this is the only opportunity to have, a huge ability to make a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars. And for some guys, hundreds of thousands of dollars right. when there's no guarantee that they will play in the professional ranks. And so it's hard to, you know, count someone else's money in this situation, but I think you can also acknowledge that, Hey man, like it's kind of a bummer. You muted Malik. <laughs> you're still muted. Oh no. I had a cough. Sorry, my bad. I had a oh, cough. You're good. Um, <laughs> I'm out of practice. You know, we got out of the Zoom thing about. I hear you. Uh, my bad. So I, I would follow up Michael's point there with like, you know, you lose those guys right to Auburn and te- Texas A&M, but I also think there's like a fun component to this with fans. Like Swain, you're looking at your click data every morning. I'm sure, and you're seeing like your top stories are church reporter related and you know, roster retention and where guys are going and roster analysis things. Um, I think there's some fun in it for fans too, because they get to speculate who they're going to get. And let's use Kansas basketball as another example here. Like it's no secret that KU, you know, they had a good year. They were a top four seed, but by Kansas standards, like the sky was falling and it was a horrible season in Lawrence last year. Well, now look at what they're doing in the transfer portal and they're going to make an addition of Zeke Mayo. They're targeting, um, Griffiths from Alabama and they're targeting AJ store from Wisconsin. It's like, well, these kids who have been really good at programs who aren't as good as ours um, traditionally or over the last several years, we can go add those guys now and we can get better. So like, I think that there's kind of like, it goes both ways with this, where you might lose people, but you also might be able to get a Dallin Hayden out of Ohio state, um, a running back who entered the portal yesterday, I think who was a former blue chip prospect who maybe now he goes to transfers to another big 10 school or a big 12 school. That's looking to have a good season and make a big addition out of key position. And like, I think that that stuff is fun for, for fans as well. And I think it's important for them to understand that, you know, while the portal will take away a lot of times it seems to give at the same time Mm -hmm. in terms of the excitement that comes with it. And also, I don't know, maybe you guys disagree with this, I feel like you gain more from the portal if you're a fan of a Big 12, an SEC, a Big 10, or ACC school than you do lose from it because a lot of the guys that you see go away are more or less pushed out of the door, especially in football. Yeah. Well, no. I, so I agree with you on, on two fronts there real quick. Um, yeah, I think you are right. Like a program like Kansas football would not have had the, the resurrection, whatever, the turnaround it has if it wasn't for the transfer portal. Because yeah. KU for a long time didn't have depth. And what they did in the portal was they got guys like Craig Young, who was at Ohio State, you know, was he going to be on the two deep? Ah, you don't know. Well, he can play at Kansas and he can play a lot of snaps at Kansas. And that's right. what helps you improve a roster where a guy like Austin Booker, right, didn't play at Minnesota, want to change his scenery. Hey, Kansas has snaps and they developed really well. And all of a sudden he could be a day two pick. And I think you're right with Kansas basketball. I remember last summer, KU basketball fans were pissed, pissed that Zuby Ejiofor and Ernest Duda transfer because they got Hunter Dickinson. 
Right. And you look at in hindsight and what did Ernest do at TCU? He was fine, but nothing great. Right. Zuby was okay at, at St. John's like, and Kansas got Hunter Dickinson, who was a second team all American while playing half the year hurt. Like it's just one of those situations where I think there's a, you like the shiny new toy, but also at the same time, you want those program guys. And that's kind of the hard part, I think, for a program like Kansas, where maybe it's different for Iowa State, right? Where you've got guys that are in the program that develop. And then maybe if they're NBA talent, maybe they go early. But you do have a lot of guys like, you know, Taman, who will be around for several years. And you do get to watch those guys grow. But that's kind of in the maybe a, a tier below a, a Kansas where every year you got to go for the top players in the portal. You got the money to go for the top players in the portal. Yep. Like it's just different, I think, in different spots where you're at in college sports in general. It is. Well, the one thing that, you know, that I've noticed about the portal, uh, and, and I think fans kind of got to get their mind wrapped around this, is, look, you take a guy from, like you mentioned, from Ohio State, and maybe he was going to be in the 2D. Well, then you get him, and people all automatically think, well, Kansas isn't as good. Well, maybe traditionally Kansas isn't as good, but the thing about Ohio State, they might have three or four guys at that position that are going to play on Sundays. That's yeah. the difference. It doesn't mean that, hey, they're not any good. It just means they're caught in a rotation to where they're not going to get as many snaps as if they come to Kansas. They're going to get a ton of snaps because the quality depth isn't there. I think that's where people make that mistake thinking, oh, well, they're just you're just taking guys that can't play at these other places. I don't think that's the truth, especially in football. Basketball is a little bit different, but in football – Taking guys from other places like that, it's like, well, hold on a second. Doesn't mean that guy can't play. Just means maybe they had four guys at that, you know, at a defensive tackle spot that they were going to get maybe eight to ten snaps a game. They can come to Iowa State and they can get 45 to 60 snaps a game. It's a big difference there between actually playing and not being able to play. Yeah, well, and I think that, you know, there was a consensus that when the transfer portal and NIL all came into place, and I think it was 2021, it's crazy that that was nearly three years ago now come this summer, that like the rich programs were only going to continue to get richer in football. So you were to continue right. to see Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State continue to dominate the sport, when in reality, the contrary has happened in, in football. And I think we've kind of seen the contrary happen a little bit in basketball too, where, you know, most recently we had – Washington and Michigan play for a national title in basketball. UConn was down for, you know, several years there at the end of Kevin Ali. And again, like maybe not the greatest coach. Now he did win a national title, but like maybe not the greatest coach for UConn after that in building a program. Now they won back-to-back national titles. Um, you've seen other programs kind of rise up in basketball and find ways to be successful in basketball in this new era of the sport. And maybe some traditional programs that haven't, been willing to adapt to it have struggled i think michigan state's an example where like you know tom Izzo hasn't been super excited to go into the transfer portal and he's kind of struggled since yes. that has become a thing um you know so i think you've Absolutely. seen yeah you've seen schools rise and you've seen schools fall with it but i think for the most part the idea that the rich are going to get richer hasn't really held true in both football and basketball swain yeah well i think too we got to see what happens when the covid years stop like washington made the college football playoff because they had a bunch of fifth and sixth year seniors, right? Year old guys, when, exactly. Yeah. When you got a bunch of old guys and that's what I'm fascinated. Why I think the, the, the current look, I think the COVID year stuff has, I think to some degree kind of hurt college sports because it's given these older guys extra years that yes. traditionally they wouldn't have had. And maybe freshmen that aren't getting the time to develop. And I think that maybe has an impact on it. And I think you are right though. Like the, the playing field has been leveled where programs like Alabama in Ohio State, they can't stockpile talent like they Correct. used to, where they could just have five stars behind five stars. Well, now, hey, man, kids want to play at the end of the day. Yep. And if you got a five star quarterback, like, what was it? I think that, like, out of the top 30 quarterbacks in a recent class, like 25 of them have already transferred. And a part of that's because I think a good amount of them go to an Alabama, a Georgia, an Ohio State, a Michigan. And then when JJ McCarthy wins the job, you're like, oh, I'm cooked. I yep. got to go somewhere else now because that guy's going to start for the next three years. And so I think that's what also helps kind of create some of that churn where then those talented players can go somewhere else. And mm -hmm. I think it's, it makes it where, yeah, I think the, the playing field is a lot more level with the talent because those big programs can't stockpile like a South Carolina and women's basketball where they have 15 scholarships. And because they're so good, they can stockpile talent. 
And I wonder if a program like that, too, in the long run, maybe they have some issues with that. If they change the scholarship numbers, too, for wins basketball, I don't know if they will. But I just think those are some of my, my ideas with it because I think it does help the playing field be level. Yeah, no, there's I, just the I, talent trickle down effect from the top down because of it. Yes. Because kids want to get on the field, they want to play. Yes, I, I think all of that's true. I love the analogy about South Carolina. The only thing about them, Don Staley has somehow convinced all of those great players that look, nobody's playing 30 minutes, nobody's averaging 20 points. We're yeah. gonna come here, we're gonna play together, and we're just gonna win. I don't know how she's done it, but she has, and it's working. It doesn't work at these other places, and we've seen it, you know, and we're going to take a quick break here in a second. But the one thing about it is everybody always complained that they thought that like a Kansas State or an Iowa State, Oklahoma State was going to get left out because they didn't have as much money as these other programs. And my pushback to that was there's always been haves and have nots. That That's always been the case, no matter what we're talking about. Texas always had more money than everybody. They're going to continue to have more money than everybody. And, and if we're really being honest, it's not like kids weren't getting paid before. Let, let's just break that. And th let's not just say that, oh, well, now they're finally getting paid. Kids mm -hmm. were getting money. It was just under the table. Now it's just out in front. And that's what people don't like. I've had so many people say, man, I wish it would go back to the other way where they were just paying guys under the table and nobody knew about it. And I'm like, did you really want that? I'm like, but it, it just, my whole thing is the whole haves and have nots, that just doesn't hold water with me because number one, in all aspects of life, there's that. And there's always going to be that in college athletics and nothing's changed. But you look at Texas, they've had more money than anybody. It was the last time they won a national title in football. And even if you do that, go back to the last time they won it before that. When was the last time they won a national title in football? So it's not always about having the most money. So I think sometimes schools got to get out of that. We'll we'll take one quick break here. Uh, we'll come back on the other side. We'll kind of dive into a little bit more basketball and find out, you know, what the transfer portal holds for both KU and Iowa State once we have a word from our, our sponsor, Synergy Financial Partners. At Synergy Financial Partners, the mission is to change the way Americans plan for their financial future. Synergy doesn't just offer you a financial plan. At Synergy, the goal is to help you find your best financial future. Learn more at SynergyFinancial.com. Welcome back to the show. Let's head back to the studio. All right. Here's again, you got Brian Hanley along with Michael Swain and Alec Busey, both from 24-7 from KU and Iowa State, respectively. So, fellas, let me kind of dive in. We're talking transfer portal today, so let's dive into the hoop side of this. I think we 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 didn't really talk all about football last year, but let's kind of dive into the to the hoops aspect of it. The season just ended. Uh, the transfer portal has been open for a while, as you mentioned. Iowa State picked up a guy; they were still playing, you know, and they weren't <laughs> the only one. I mean, I think that is first of all, I think it's next level. Because I think when you have guys on your staff that, hey, man, we got to get into this thing. We got to dive in because if we don't, somebody else is in it. I think it's next level. It's wild that that is actually when a transfer portal would be open. I think the NCAA, I'm like, holy cow, what are you doing? But the rules are the rules. This is what it is. And I think, I mean, if you're competing. I'll start with you, Michael. It's pushed out a lot of coaches. And, and while they're going to say that that's not what pushed them out, it did. Mm -hmm. uh, Alec, you mentioned Tom Izzo not wanting to dive into it, and it's hurting Michigan State. I think eventually here in the next few years, either he's going to change or he's just going to be out. I think it's going to be the latter. I think he's just going to be done. I love that Bill Self has embraced it. And I think and, – and just said, you know what? I may not like it, but these are the rules – and I'm going to attack this thing, and we're going to be the best that we can be at this. I like that aspect. Yeah, I wish some other national college basketball people realized that. But I, but hey, when Bill Self says you think about the off season, right? That's a that's a story that is uh, going across everyone, right? Where that's a bad thing that he's thinking about the off season when Iowa State gets a commitment the next day. Um, yeah. No, he has adapted. And look, I think you look at the teams that win in college basketball right now, like they're old. And I think to some degree, if you're going to be Kansas, like for a long time, right, like I mentioned earlier, right, the Frank Masons, the Devontae Grahams were the guys that carried the program. 
And now it is still those players, but they haven't played all four years at Kansas, right? You look right. at someone like Kevin McCuller this past season um, being a really impactful player. Next season, Hunter Dickinson will be back most likely, and he'll be a very impactful player. And so what KU's done is they've basically gone out and gotten seasoned players from other places where, you know, Zeke Mayo has played a bunch of basketball for South Dakota State, and he right. fits what Kansas needs, right? He can score. A little bit bigger. He's not going to be a great defender. He's not going to be the an A plus athlete, but it reminds you of Jalen Wilson almost of how he uses his body in the right ways to get to the spots he wants to get to. That's a great addition. Someone like Riley Kugel, yeah, okay, it didn't really work for him at Florida or at Florida, but he's got NBA talent, and you could see some of those flashes during SEC play when he shot over thirty three percent, thirty five percent from three. So you can see the way that Bill Self has adapted, and obviously they're really. All in on, on Ryland Griffin, too, from Alabama, 39% three-point shooter who they recruited out of high school. Like, that's the crazy part, too, is now you're getting these kids that are going in the portal that Kansas recruited back in high school. A.J. Mm -hmm. Store is another one where Kansas had him on campus for an official visit. So you're seeing all these prior relationships for KU come back into play. And that's the case everywhere, right? That's the case in football. That's the case in basketball where the past relationships come into play. But you're right. Like, Bill Self has adapted. And I think – he is of the mindset now that he's going to do what it takes to win. And what it takes to win is going and getting experienced players and trying to put together an older team that knows how to deal with the ebbs and flows of a season and can be more consistent than a freshman like maybe El Marco Jackson was this past year, where, hey, he has a good game, but the next three games are, oh, man, kind of rough. Or a Grady right. Dick, where he even had his ups and downs through the course of the season. So I really do think you're seeing Bill Self really lean into the portal and go all out. You know, KU passed on having someone like maybe Liam McNeely, a five-star kid who seven years ago Kansas would have added because the portal really wouldn't have been a big thing. But now Bill Self's like, I don't want a young shooter that athletically isn't an A-plus, maybe not defensively an A-plus. Let me go get, you know, potentially like a Ryan Griffin or someone else of that nature. So sure. I think overall it really is going to help Kansas because they have the ability to go out and get those guys where other programs are probably in a different spot. Right. Are you, are you saying that the – Bill Self Revenge Tour is in full effect. Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> I mean, look, I last year. Twitter timeline. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know about that, man. Um, look, the NCAA tournament's like a, a crapshoot. You don't know what's going to happen, right? It's one game samples. But I think in terms of building a roster, I think Bill Self's done with having a six-man roster. And obviously, look, last year was a one-time scenario. They, they vacated two scholarships and kid got kicked off the team um, in first week of school. Like they played last year really, really with a shallow roster, and that will not be the case next year. No, I definitely agree. I, I like that aspect. Look, I like Kansas for the most part of what he has done. Um, Alec, I think that Iowa State has kind of leaned into the transfer portal on the hoop side as well. I think what they do on a on a on a basis, look, it, it's it's not Kansas, you know, but who is? You know, I <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. But I think what they're doing and how they build a roster, I think that's the way that you have to do it nowadays. And, you know, Michael's right. Build it from from a, an athletic standpoint, build it from a an older roster standpoint. I think that more than anything right now. Look, look at John Calipari. For years, he was out there just getting one and done, and it worked once. But you look at that team and you're like, okay, those are guys that, I mean, Anthony Davis is on the all-75 team in the NBA. I mean, that's who they had on that roster. You keep going back, and now it's like they can't even get to a second weekend anymore, much less go to a Final Four. They can't get to the second weekend with these guys. I'm like, you can't build a roster like that anymore. You, it just can't be a bunch of young guys. They're just not winning. I mean, and, and, and if we really look at it over the, the history of the NCAA tournament, how many freshman-laden teams have won an NCAA tournament? I, I bet you we can count it on one hand. Yeah, I, I think what Swain said earlier about, you know, like older teams winning now in the NCAA tournament, even in the regular season, the best example of that is Kentucky because for the first, I should say Kentucky under uh, John Calipari is probably the best example of that because they went to, was it four Final Fours in five years from yep. 2011 to 2015? Now, they only won one national title, but like once you get to the Final Four, like who really cares? Now, if you're Kentucky, like you're a program where like, hey, you got to win the national title. But like nationally, like we all remember those Kentucky teams at the beginning of the Cal era as the best teams in the country every single year. For someone who's 24, like those Kentucky teams were awesome growing up. They were cool. They were swaggy. They had John Wall and he was 
flex until the left, throwing money out his hand, like doing all that stuff. And they were super cool. But then, you know, the, after making it to lead eight in 2019, they failed to make it out of the first weekend in the last four or five years. And it kind of leads to this weird departure. Um, but obviously I think Iowa state and the way they're building their roster, um, with TJ Otzelberger is a lot different, um, than what a lot of the most nationally successful programs are going to be able to do just because of a resource perspective. But I think one of the reasons why there's a lot of reasons to believe in Iowa state is because they've done such a good job of retaining talent. I think in Otzelberger is now three, four off seasons, they've lost one transfer that they probably wanted to keep. And that was Tyrese Hunter after his freshman season at Iowa State transfers to Texas. And if you look at a big picture, they kind of won the transaction because Taman Lipsy is a better point guard anyway. Yes, he um, is. And he wouldn't have played over Tyrese Hunter, I would imagine, early in his career. So they kind of won the whole thing anyway, yep. um, which worked out in their favor. But, you know, this offseason, they've basically got to replace their entire front court with Rob Jones, Trey King, um, Hassan Ward, all the partying. And they've done a good job of that so far. Um, they have two transfers in the front court. Deshaun Jackson will transfer in from Charlotte. Um, he started his career at Washington State. Um, and then Brandon Chatfield transfers in from Seattle University. Um, he also started his career at Washington State. They were there together, I think, for one year. And they've got a couple other kids that they're planning to get on campus this weekend. And I think they feel pretty good about their chances to land at least one of them. And if they do, I think that they're going to have their transfer class of four or five kids, um, which also includes Nate Heisey, a transfer yeah. guard from Northern Iowa. And I think that that's what you're going to kind of see Iowa State's offseason be every offseason is adding three to five transfers, retaining your core guys of yeah. three to four guys, adding two to three freshmen, and then that's your roster every year. And I think if we're being honest, I think that's how every coach would like it to be if possible. 100%. 100%. I, I don't see there being – if you're trying to be successful – I don't see there being a way that you can't not want to have that model. You The days of trying to bring in five and six freshmen, number one, you know that after a year, you're going to lose half of those guys anyway because all of them aren't going to play. That's yep. the whole thing. So they're going to leave. So I think that's the model. Uh, I, I think Iowa State, I think they've done a great job of doing that. I think Bill Self has done a great job of doing that. Uh, I, I just think if you're trying to be successful, you've got to lean into this transfer portal thing. I'm not saying – that you got to be unless, you know, obviously if a coach leaves and then the entire roster leaves, yeah, that, that's something different. But, you know, I think the way to do it, bring in three or four transfer guys, two or three freshmen, it's going to be whatever it is, and that's how you have to build your roster. Also think this. Now, you guys can tell me, on your specific staffs in general, do they have a, a, a coach designated or maybe somebody else designated to the transfer portal because I think you got to have somebody like that, especially in football. In football, I think it's essential, or you're not doing yourself a, a, any justice at all. You're not even trying, to be honest with you. But in basketball, do the staffs have? Do they have somebody responsible, or is it just another coach that's responsible? Alec, you go first. Yeah, I mean, and I would say that there's the three or four assistant coaches that are all diving into the portal, um, gotcha. and it was starting during the NCAA tournament where they're diving into the portal and they're following everyone that's in the portal, trying to scout, trying to see who's a good fit for them. Um, and obviously, you know, they have a good understanding of who's going to enter the portal. Uh, not saying that they're, you know, tampering and stuff, but you know, like Swain, you and I both knew guys who were going to enter the portal. It's not super hard when you watch a ton of college basketball and you're connected to people in college basketball to at least have an idea of certain players who could enter the transfer portal. And, um, you know, some may be surprising to fans, but I think if you pay a lot of attention to the sport, you can get, a good read on what certain guys might do. Um, so for Iowa State, it's an entire staff approach. It's a lot of how they approach high school recruiting as well and trying to, you know, have a staff approach to scouting, have a staff approach to who they're recruiting. And for the most part, it's worked well for them. Yeah, for KU, I mean, this is something that KU fans have actually talked about a little bit more because KU football was one of the first schools to do the general manager tag mm -hmm. on someone when Lance Leipold took over in 2021. They were one of the first schools to have that, Rob Ionello. And People have mentioned it for, for Kansas basketball, maybe. Is it worth doing with how many guys go in the portal, having someone that's just designated to doing that? And I think it's different for basketball because they're just less guys. Like we're not right. talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and, and approaching thousand, right? It's a, it's less, and so it's probably easier to manage too. You can kind of chop and change, right? You don't need to go look at a guy that averaged two minutes per game at, at North Folk State. Like you don't right. really need to look at him. But I think there's something to be said for – having 
um, a whole staff approach with it where you got to make sure everyone's on the same page. And I think that's what Kansas does. They have different, like the coaches are looking, but then I, my understanding at least is that they come together, discuss the players. And if they're all on the same page that they like a guy, then they move on them. Right. I know there are a couple of guys this portal season that have gone in, get a little bit of interest. And then maybe as the coaches talk about it more, it's probably like, okay, we like him, but do we love him? Mm, maybe not. Let's just wait and see if we can find the next guy. And I think that's an area where Kansas has improved. I think last year, last off season, KU was looking for the perfect player. And right. I think this year they figured out, okay, perfect players, first of all, in the portal don't exist because if they were, they'd be in the NBA. Right. That's how it works. So you got to figure out, okay, how does the fit work? Like Alex said, how do they fit the culture? How do they fit the program and fit your roster? And so I think KU is, is growing in that regard as these off seasons go. Cause that's the thing, right? This is the first time for everybody with the portal. Like this isn't, hasn't been going on for 20 years. Like, you know, right. you're four five, six of this. So I think it's just growing and trying to figure out the best way to do it. Yeah. Here's a question before we wrap this up, I'm going to throw this out there to you guys. Um, as far as the portal is concerned, you know, the NBA has basically told kids, if you're not in our league by the time you're 20 years old, you've got a problem, uh, that there's something wrong with you, uh, which to me, fundamentally, I think is horrible because at 21 years old, uh, a lot of us haven't even matured. You know, I know when I way back when, when I was 21 years old, I mean, I wasn't mature at all, but it is what it is. I think one of the things that now looking at the transfer portal uh, in, in building rosters, you, we talked about it being older and having an older roster. Is it because that now that the NBA has basically told all these kids that there's an issue, these guys are transferring around. It's kind of what you, you mentioned earlier, Swain. They're trying to get more money, as much money as they possibly can, because they know, look, the NBA doesn't want me. I'm 20 years old and they're telling me no. So I'm going to have to go overseas if I want to continue playing basketball. So why not continue to make as much money now? And by doing that, I'm going to go from Charlotte to Iowa State, from UAB to Kansas. Is that an aspect that maybe we're not looking at? That somebody brought that to my attention earlier today, and I thought when I told them I was doing this show, and I thought, you know what? That's a good point. Let me ask the guys how they feel about it because I think the NBA, I think they do have kind of the thumbprint on a lot of this stuff where – you're not going to the NBA. We don't like you because you're 20 years old and you haven't fully grasped, you know, everything that there is to know about basketball. So we don't want you in the league. So you have to stay. And now they're thinking, well, heck, I might as well go get as much money as I can because my days are numbered. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that because Ochai Baj was a lottery pick as a 23 year old. So, mm -hmm. you know, yes, like ideally, right, you want to draft off potential. And typically the guys that have the raw potential are 18, 19, 20 because of, right, they just haven't played as much. But I, I think that you look at – it's probably changed a lot for big men more than anything. Right. Where guys like Hunter Dickinson who don't have A-plus athleticism probably aren't NBA centers because they don't necessarily just have that right – maybe feel in my opinion. But they can be really good college players. And Zach Eady and Drew Timmy, Oscar Shibwe, like these are all guys that can – make hundreds of thousands of dollars in college. And that probably wasn't going to be a guarantee in the NBA. And right. if they do go to the NBA, you're looking at the G league and that's a much different lifestyle than it is playing at Kansas, Kentucky, Purdue, Gonzaga, where you got your own place. You got a nice practice facility. You're chartering flights everywhere. Like it's just a different lifestyle. And so I think players can enjoy that. And so I think to some degree that Avenue is carved out because of NIL and I think players are more willing to stick around because they can get paid. Where Bill Self's talking about this a bunch. There are players years ago that left because they wanted to start making money so they can help support their family. And that's just different now. They don't have to worry about that, making that big decision, because they can start making stuff in college. So I don't know if it's so much as age as it is just earning potential and trying to find the right time to make that jump. I do think that there's certain guys, though, that are really good college players that, you know, maybe don't have the greatest NBA ceiling or the greatest opportunity to make a big role in the NBA. I think to use a big 12 example, Kevin McCuller would be a decent example of that. Someone who elected to stay in college for an extra year. I think you use Jalen Wilson as that too. And someone who's not carved out an opportunity in the NBA. Is he with the Raptors or the Nets? Wilson's with the Nets, right? 
Yeah, he's with the Nets now. Yeah. So and he got off of his two way and I think got a fully guaranteed deal. So he was able to work his way into having a role in the NBA. Um, you know, I think if Kevin McCullough didn't get hurt this year, he's someone who maybe works his way into that. But I also think context is important. You realize like how bad this draft is. Um, and in a deeper draft with more talent, maybe it's harder for a guy like Kevin McCullough to do something like that. Um, I do think that there is some credence to the idea, though, that if like if you're 21, 22 and you're not in the NBA at that point, then like your opportunities are fairly limited in terms of getting there and being mm-hmm. a first round or a lottery pick, which is what all these kids want to be. And if you're not guaranteed a first round pick um, or a two way contract, that's where I think coming back to college for another mm-hmm. season becomes really valuable especially with some of the numbers that I've heard this off season for NIL, like it's gone up a lot this off season compared to where mm-hmm. it was last off season, which is kind of interesting to me just because I feel like the market was going to set itself the other way first and like donor fatigue would start to set in because rich people didn't get to be rich by being bad at business. And I don't know what good business there is in donating like dozens and hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> to your school's NIL collective. Like, there's no good ROI on that other than watching your favorite team win, which right. I guess if you have that much money, like go ahead, donate your money to it. I'm all for the kids getting paid. Um, in general, though, I just think in general, if you're, you know, 21, 22 and you're not in the league at that point, it's hard for you to get there and make a sizable impact. Um, and I think we've seen that just with the way the NBA is drafting, like they're going to draft kids with upside. And I think, you know, use KU as example, like, Johnny Furphy didn't have the greatest freshman season at KU. He had really good moments. Um, he had really good flashes, but he also struggled at times, but he looks like he's going to be a potential top 25 pick in the draft. Um, and that's someone who I think with, you know, high upside an NBA team will take a chance on. And it's better for him, I think, to go to the league and get a guaranteed contract that guarantees him somewhere between five to $10 million um, than it is to come back to Kansas for a sophomore season and make – several hundred thousand or whatever it is like it's a gamble in the long run but i think it's a smart gamble yeah i think you're right though with the, the draft this is a terrible draft and so i think yeah. if this was a normal draft i think johnny furphy is a second round pick and he comes back obviously the nil thing is a little iffy when you're talking about international prospects right there are right. loopholes and right like that's the thing here too like well especially with big 12 mexico getting canceled you can't well, go yeah. or you can't go to mexico genuinely that was that was something that would have helped kansas if, if it would have stayed now there are ways, and this is the thing about NIL that I, I freaking hate is like they're really it's so loosey goosey. It's like, oh, we don't really know. Maybe it worked, maybe it wouldn't. It's like, okay, there are laws in this country. Like th- there are certain right. things you can't can't do on a student visa to play basketball. So what exactly can he make? And getting a firm answer on that is uh not easy because I think people are a little wishy-washy on on how that works for any international prospect, whether it be, you know, for fee, Zach Eady, Oscar, she like, it doesn't matter. So that was one issue. K you probably ran into, but you're right. Like if you're a first round pick, you jump. And if you're not, you probably go back. Cause I think if you're a fringe second round pick, like Jalen Wilson was two years ago, look, you can go back and be a national player of the year candidate, a first team all American. If you improve and play on a good team. And at that point, you're no worse off. Like Jalen no, Wilson would have no, been no worse no. off coming coming back to Kansas. Like, and if it didn't work, he's no worse off than the situation he was in before. And I think that's what you're seeing yeah. a lot of these older kids. Hunter Diggins is the same same example. Like, he's no worse off coming back to KU for another year because he knows he's probably not an NBA player in the long run. And if exactly. he turns into one, like staying at KU for another year isn't going to hurt him any any more mm-hmm. than it already has to be in college. For right. he'll be a fifth year player next year, I believe. Three years at Michigan. Maybe his last year. Yeah, he'll be a fifth-year player at KU next year using his COVID season. So, um, yeah, I think, it, you know, he has nothing to lose by coming back to Kansas for another year and making potentially seven figures. Gotcha. Well, guys, I appreciate you guys taking the time to to talk about a lot of this today. Uh, I, I know it's a topic that Transfer Portal and NIL, all that stuff that we go over over and time and time again, but I think it's important to, to discuss, it, especially transfer portal with as crazy as it is, you know, especially during this time. I know you guys are super busy. I'll let you guys get back to it. I appreciate it. We'll take one last break before we end the show from our sponsor with Synergy Financial Group. At Synergy Financial Partners, the vision is to build the world's largest consumer financial education and empowerment company. Synergy doesn't just offer you a financial plan. At Synergy The goal is to help you find your best financial future. Learn more at SynergyFinancial.com. Welcome back to the show. Let's head back to the studio. Well, I mean, 
the transfer portal, like I said, it is wide open. Uh, basketball and football both at the same time. It's crazy time going on right now. Um, but look, ultimately, if they would just tweak the things to some make sense stuff, I think fans, myself included, would we we would get we could get behind it. Uh, it's not that I'm not behind it, and I don't think that most fans are against it. If it just, I know the bad word regulation. I know everybody hates that word, but we do have laws in this country for a reason. And there's no reason that the transfer portal slash NIL, whatever you want to call all of it, you want to mix it all together, that's fine. If they just put a little bit of regulation in that, I think everybody would be fine. Uh, jumping from team to team every single year is absolutely insane, but that's what we're seeing. That's what's being allowed. So hopefully we can, the NCAA, if, if they're just allowed to govern it the right way, I think everybody would be okay with it. But the way that it is right now, it's absolutely insane. Got to get a hold on it. So I appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you again. As always, remember to like, comment, more importantly, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. We're always Tuesday through Friday, 1 p.m. Central Time, live on YouTube. We appreciate you guys. We'll be back tomorrow to see if we can't do this thing better. See you later. This has been a Spirit Street production. Please support this show by subscribing to this YouTube channel or follow us on your favorite podcast platform.